know your place. So there's a lot of stuff out there, um, like almost overwhelming these days in terms of what's available online. Um, and in such a vast variety of um, formats and um, and repositories. So you've got, you know, big national collections like the National Register of Scotland. Uh, you've got all those kind of regional collections. So if you think about the uh, local authority um, historic environment records, they all feed into Canmore, all that archaeological data on a local authority level. Um, I think about all those kind of wee museums and, and local galleries and stuff. A lot of them have collections and it's catalogued and it's online. You have big organisational collections. So if you think about Glasgow Uni, um, they have a big archive there around, you know, specifically about the university. They've got the business archive. They've got the Hunterian Museum and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, you've got sort of private collections, some of the big landowners and stuff you think about the Duke of Buclue he's got a big collection uh, they don't tend to let anybody near them though um, special interest collections if you were doing a project looking at I don't know like um, public health in the 19th century you might go to the Royal College of Surgeons they've got a big archive so most of them now have their catalogues online it might be in a database, you know, in a searchable format. It might even just be like in a, a PDF document. Some of them have um, all or parts of their collections actually digitized and available online. Some of them are free to access and, and other ones you have uh, either like a kind of subscription service or, uh, or um, a kind of pay-per-view kind of scheme. But Really sitting behind all that is, is generally a database in some form. So this is the first thing to remember when you're doing research. Think about it. Um, make a little research plan about how you're gonna kind of tackle it. So um, think very carefully about the keywords that you're gonna use. Um, make sure they're really relevant. Um, think about uh, sentiment synonyms <laughs> and maybe alternative spellings. So all these databases, uh, all these data sets are going to have some uh, kind of imperfection because at some point there's been some human data entry, um, which means there'll be typos, spelling errors, um, mistranslations, mistranscriptions. Um, a lot of archives uh, during the 90s and early 2000s kind of farmed out a lot of their data entry. Um, and sometimes it went abroad. And you know, you're dealing with Scott's handwriting. <laughs> it's um there's inevitably uh, gonna be a lot of kind of typos and stuff slipping in there. Um and people not understanding uh, old words, uh, you might get a, a, a McDonald becoming a MacDonald. Um, in archaeology, if you think about all those different kind of site types, um, you can have terms that kind of go out of use. Um, or you might have alternative names for the same type of site. So start, you know, think around about that. Uh, to make sure that you're kind of grabbing everything that's going to be relevant to your to your subject. Um, and also for each database, for each catalogue that you're looking at, um, check out what's in the advanced search. So for instance, here's Canmore. You've got a kind of simple keyword search there available. Um, you can search with um, map coordinates. And there's a little uh, row there, classification. So when you start typing into that, that brings up a list of um, different site type categories. So ones that are already set. So you can use that uh, ditto for, for discipline. Um, this is uh, the advanced search page for SCRAN. Um, that's a big kind of aggregated site for about, um, well, actually over 300 different galleries, museums, libraries and archives in Scotland. It's a big national repository uh, and it's very kind of image based. Um, and you'll notice there, there's a couple of drop downs for and, and if I did drop that down, it would also give me the option for 
or and not. Um, and that's your next tip. So uh, make friends with the Boolean search. Um, and please don't feel uh, the, like you need to try and memorize or, or understand this at this stage if you've not come up against it, because it takes a little while to get your head around and you can always go back and view it again. But basically, these are ways of um, uh, narrowing and refining your search or excluding particular terms again so that you can um, you can you can get more accurate returns basically um, so that's your options and uh, we'll look at that graphically uh, through the medium of tonic sphere here um, that might help uh, just give you an idea of what would come back from each search so um, for an and search you're essentially specifying that all these values need to be true um, so uh, that page that's returned will only show you content that includes all of those elements, all of those biscuits. Um, if you wanted to narrow your search a bit, uh, sorry, widen it a bit, because that's going to give you a, a fairly, you know, specific return. Um, and often and is the kind of default for search engines. You don't need to physically put it in, say, if you're searching Google, but that's the basis of a very simple Google search. If it's more than, you know, one word. Um, if you use or, um, or, one or more of the values need to be true. So you might just get back um, caramel logs or wafers. And then if you wanted to exclude any returns with tea cake sneaking in, um, then you would use not. But again, you don't need to worry about absorbing this all in one go. Go and try it out. Oh, oh no, gone too far. Sorry. <laughs> um, another couple of search tips. If you need a really specific term, if you put it in quotation marks, um, that'll only return um, instances where you have an exact match. That can be really helpful. Um, you can use wild cards. So um, for instance, if you, yeah, I've used the example of Archeo there. If you typed Archeo and then put an asterisk in, it would return um, anything beginning with those seven letters or is that eight no that's seven letters um so you get archaeology would return and archaeopteryx um uh and you can do the same at the other side of the word so if you only wanted to find um you know words ending in ology um then you could do that uh and if you use a question mark that can be really useful where you've got um Say, for instance, like a Mick and a MacDonald, and you wanted a search that covered both options. So those are, that's a, you know, Mick and Mac names get mixed up all the time, and it can be the same individual. They're just recorded slightly differently. You can kind of lose track of them that way. So if you put that question mark in, it gives you options uh, that will return multiple spellings of a particular word. So um, this is a diagram of the sort of online resources that I use on a regular basis. And I've kind of grouped them by period, place, and people. Um, there's a lot of overlap there, and a lot of those sources will return, you know, you might look for people and you might look for information on a particular period as well. Um, it was more for, um, as a kind of first point of entry, these are the sources that I would go to if I was looking for a particular person. Um, you know, I might go to Scotland's people or whatever. Um, can I just ask, uh, how, like, which of those sites uh, have you used before or are you aware of in those lists? Anybody? <laughs> like, um, do you I know oh. I've used PassMap and Canmore before. Yeah, PassMap and Canmore. 
Any others? I've used those and I've also used the the National Library of Scotland maps. Yep. And a few others I recognize. Yeah. But yeah. I mean it's it's quite a big list. <laughs> Um, and and part of it is is kind of understanding where you where you go to find each thing. Um, it's also very Glasgow focused this because that's just tends to be what I use. But um, for you guys, yeah, Past Map and Canmore um, as archaeologists use that a lot, and also yep, the National Library of Scotland maps in particular. Um, however, there are a lot of sources in there that even if you're not working on more recent um, sites or collections or, or, or whatever, or they're, they're not in an urban context, um, there's, there's still plenty in there that you would find useful um, either as a kind of primary source as a, or as a complementary source to whatever you're working on. So it's a lot. Uh, so I thought for this session, we would concentrate on looking at a couple of the the kind of more common sites um, and the ones that are, are good kind of gateways. So not too specific. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, some of these are aggregator sites. So they're pulling in information from um, multiple catalogues. And it does kind of take the pain out of searches at times. Um, <clears throat> ditto the national repositories. Um, some of those are just really big and, um, and cover a lot of material. So yeah, past map and Canmore. So they're drawing from the same uh, the same catalogues essentially. They just have a slightly different interface. So past map is is more map focused, more place focused. Um, if you were doing a kind of desktop survey, um, desktop research classically, you would start with past map uh, and look at kind of what's on the ground. If you were maybe more interested in looking at a, a site type uh, or, um, oh God, I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, or a particular period, you might go to Canmore. Um, so that's pulling in from uh, listed buildings, sites and monuments records, uh, what else is in there? So those are the legally protected sites. And then you've got some of your inventories. So the battlefields inventories in there, conservation areas, um, oh God, world heritage sites and, uh, uh, God, what else? Oh, gardens and design landscapes. There's a couple of others as well. And then you've also, on top of that, you've got the um, that Canmore database, uh, which is the database of known archaeological sites for Scotland, which is built on the kind of regional historic environment records. They're all in there as well. So it's a, it's a bit of a stew of built environment stuff. Um, and you'll use that a lot. Um, SCRAN is the Scottish Cultural Resource Access Network. Um, it was created in the early 2000s, so it looks quite dated, but it's still a really good source. Um, and alongside the digitized material, which is a lot of it, so it's very image heavy, um, but uh, there, there's a lot of um, the catalogue information is really good as well. You get a lot of um, descriptive information there and it's pulling in from over 300 museums, galleries, archives and libraries across Scotland. So again, um, a nice kind of one-stop shop. Um, SCAN is the Scottish Archive Network. Uh, that was all the kind of smaller archives all coming together. Uh, to create a big catalogue that is currently being overhauled um, and there'll be a new repository coming online soon. Uh, Scotland's Places, that's another one that's really good to investigate if you're an archaeologist because again it's quite place-based um, and that pulls in from Historic Environment Scotland, National Records of Scotland and National Libraries of Scotland and we'll talk a little bit about Scotland's uh, places down the line. Scotland's people, if you're if you're looking for anything on kind of births, marriages and deaths, so you're looking for a person, you'd head there. It's a paid for service and it's not cheap. Um, National Library of Scotland, uh, so obviously it's got the maps. Um, 
there's also all the books because it is a library um, and so post office um, directories are a good source of information um, they also have quite a few maps in there um, there's the Scottish Screen Archive they're part of the National Library of Scotland as well don't forget about uh, having a look at um, at moving image material sometimes you can pick up all kinds of stuff in there um, you know people on picnics up hill forts and that kind of thing um, and national records of Scotland so that's our, our national archive um, and there's a bit of overlap there with the Scottish archive network sometimes you've got to do a search in both to find what you're looking for um, types of documents uh, this is just some of them, um, but obviously you've got your historic maps. There's also estate plans. Oh man, if you if you get an archaeology site on an estate plan, it's usually really well. Um, you know, there's there's a level of detail that you're not going to get on historic maps, particularly in a rural context. So they are great actually um, if you look out. Architectural drawings again, if you're uh, you might be doing a standing building survey. Um, so you'd be looking at the Dean of Guild plans, if they're available, any buildings um, dated after about 1870, the architects had to um, supply uh, plans and elevations to the, to the corporation for review. Ordnance survey name books. So um, again, these are really useful. And uh, from an archeological perspective, we use name books a lot. So when the Ordnance Survey went out to do their first uh, edition maps, which you might have come across, um, so they're very detailed. Um, alongside the cartographers were a team of um, people recording local place names, and they went into quite a bit of detail on that. And also alongside um, information on a place name that would give all any kind of known alternative spellings and... Um, other information about who owned the site or building or farm or whatever. Uh, sometimes they'll note local antiquities, that kind of stuff. So it's worth having a having a look there too. Um, statistical accounts of Scotland. Um, again, they'll quite often have a little chapter on antiquities. So this was um, a very kind of detailed account of every parish in Scotland. There was two um, produced the new statistical account, uh, sorry, the old statistical, statistical account in the 1790s, um, and then the second was in the 1850s. Uh, and they're very, very detailed. They were written by the local minister. Um, so you, you quite often get some interesting takes on the local population when they're mainly complaining about nobody going to church enough. Um, but yeah, it's quite it's quite funny sometimes. Um, you might have census information. There's valuation rules. Anything that can be taxed um, or money extracted from it'll be in the records somewhere. Um, so school rolls, voter rolls, uh, births, marriages, and deaths. Uh, church records can be really good. Um, again, the the church was. Um, really instrumental in kind of administration of, of parishes um, until really the kind of early 1800s. So there's generally a lot of uh, records out there associated with, um, with churches uh, and of course newspapers and there's a bunch of other stuff as well, but that's kind of headlines. So quite often you'll find that, um, particularly if you're searching archives, uh, you might just be given a reference to a per particular um, collection uh, and then you need to go and arrange an in-person meeting. If you go in, not just to an archive, but to a library, a museum or gallery, like ask them for help. Did, did they really enjoy helping people? And for some reason, people get very shy about asking for help or feel like it's, a, a, I don't know, it's an imposition or whatever don't worry about it go and ask them they know their collections inside out so you know make make use of the staff oh I'm too far there yep okay national library of scotland map site it's amazingly addictive um i'm not going to spend too much time talking about the actual site because i think you're just best off just to kind of dive in there it does all kinds of cool stuff um 
and yeah, just go have a look. So yeah, a lot of their ha their maps, not all of them are georeferenced. Georeference just means that the historic map is tied to uh, a modern base map. So you can see kind of relative locations reasonably accurately. So it tends to be later um, maps where they're accurate enough to do that. Um, but it's really, really helpful. Um, the NLS also has the Scottish Post Office de directories, um, historic newspapers as well. Um, their search facility is not great, I have to say, but otherwise, no complaints. So thinking about historic maps uh, from that kind of research perspective, um, what are they good for? Well, building up that kind of... Uh, uh, yeah, picture of kind of landscape scale changes um, and yeah, kind of land ownership, understanding all the kind of settlement patterns and stuff, place name study. Um, but just remember, maps are always an expression of power. They're extremely expensive uh, to make and produce. So there's there's usually um, you know think about the the motivation <clears throat> behind the mapping. Uh, who mapped it and to what end um, and what's it showing. So for Glasgow area um, and for beyond, uh, your kind of key maps. Uh, so Timothy Pont's really the first map of Scotland that covers the entire mainland and then it's kind of reproduced uh, by Johannes Blau. You might see his maps popping up quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> Pont's maps um, went missing. He, he did do the entire mainland of Scotland um, and they were they were transported over to the Netherlands. Um, and I seem to remember there was something about the ship got attacked by pirates or something. And anyway, half of them disappeared. So Blau ended up, he used some of Pont's maps as a base um, and then filled in the gaps. Uh, William Roy, that's um, that's the first really kind of accurate map of Scotland, um, and that was produced after the uh, Jacobite Rebellion um, and Culloden, and it's a that that's a power map really. That was um, that was all about mapping all the kind of roads and points of you know for kind of it was all about moving troops around the country to. To kind of quell any potential rebellions so that was what they were interested in and that tended to be what they mapped it was the kind of terrain and topography and where's the farmland if we need to eat and where do you get across this river etc um, and then there's a couple of others and then you get into the ordnance survey editions those are the first like really accurate maps um, and there's a series of them um, from the 1850s onwards um, and then you get the kind of town plan editions, which are much more detailed. Um, if you're working in a, in a kind of urban context, um, so you would you would always look at the ordnance survey. That's a you know national uh, editions, but um, it's worth checking out the goods fire insurance maps as well because they're because they're really, really detailed because they're for fire insurance. So they're very concerned with what materials are being used in particular buildings. Um, and yeah, they show loads. Uh, so this is this is Roy's map here. Uh, complementary sources for map editions, um, statistical accounts would be one, and also those ordnance survey uh, place name books. So they are very closely tied to that first edition ordnance survey map. They're, they go along with it. Uh, and then you've got, so we talked earlier on um, about past map and Canmore. This is where they're drawing their material from. And there's past map with its um, mappy interface. Um, and it's free and this is all the material that's in it. It's a lot. Canmore. You know that one. Um, and what else can I say about Canmore? Uh, yeah, there is a map based um, search element to that as well, but it is primarily you go in through the kind of traditional catalog route. And then Scran. Um, so Scran is a paid for service, but you, you guys will get it for free 
via the university um, and your student logins. Um, alongside all those kind of individual records, um, they also have um, kind of Pathfinder packs, and it's mainly aimed at uh, kind of secondary school kids, but actually um, there's a lot of really good material in there. Uh, so there'll be ones on kind of industry or, um, I don't know, herring fishing or, or thing that is worth having a wee look in uh, just as a kind of, if it's something that you, you don't know anything about, it's quite a nice, they're nice little primers um, and it's all based on their collections. Now, Scotland's places, that's another one that's really useful from an archaeological perspective. Um, so anything that's taxable, uh, so you can see there dog taxes, um, even the dogs were taxed. Uh, you've got, um, yeah, window tax, dog tax, horse tax, servant tax, cart tax, um, yeah any tax you could ever think of. Um, there's the Ordnance Survey name books um, and yeah, bunch of other stuff in there. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a list of them. And in terms of archives, so we spoke a little bit about the Scottish Archive Network. Um, it's a really, really ugly dated looking site now. It does still work, but they are in the process of overhauling it at the moment to, to produce a, a, a kind of better spec hub. It was just developed in the early 2000s and it now really looks its age. Um, so we're quite looking forward to seeing how that pans out. Um, National Records of Scotland, Archives Hub, we haven't talked about them. That's all the university archives. Um, so Glasgow, Edinburgh, well, actually it's UK wide. Um, so you'll find stuff of theirs in there. Um, and then there's also the National Archive. So national in the UK sense. Um, sometimes it's just, uh, yeah, just because it doesn't pop up in one catalog doesn't mean it's not there. Um, and you've just got to cast about um, and then you've got sort of local archives, North Lanarkshire archives have a, um, an online portal, as do uh, Glasgow City. Um, yeah, the old and new statistical accounts, we did talk a little bit about that. Um, again, because it covers the entire country, um, it catches uh, the kind of rural communities in that kind of transitional period, but also um, that kind of early industrial boom. Um, oh yeah, sorry, it was 1830s for the new statistical account. I, I told you it was 1850s, that's nonsense. Anyway, um, yeah, very detailed parish by parish accounts, quite often something about antiquities in there, local antiquities, um, and also uh, quite often, um, <laughs> Some really rude uh, dissy comments from the from the local minister. Uh, so this one is from the parish uh, of the Barony of Glasgow. Um, this is from the old statistical account, so 1790s, and um, he's talking a bit about um, the kind of health of the of the local population. So there's been a big smallpox outbreak. Um, there's a bit of uh, chat about inoculation, so vaccination essentially um, there, uh, <laughs> and that their unreasonable prejudices uh, were wearing off, um, and also complained that uh, the, the inhabitants being employed in manufactures, many of them are very subject to flatulency. Um, I'm not quite sure why um, working in manufactures might make you farty, but there you go. Um, and finally, last thing to say is um, it's worth checking out ebooks as well. Um, so Google and Project Gutenberg and the Internet Archive have digitized like loads of kind of out of uh, out of print books, so they're out of copyright. Um, <clears throat> and Google's also done that with um, with some newspapers. 
So uh, I know some of you have been using the British newspaper archive for the West Boat House project. Um, and it's great. It's not completely comprehensive, but it's, it's a pretty great resource, but it is a paid for service, whereas um, the Google Google Archive newspapers is uh, is all free, so it's worth. Sometimes you can find stuff on Google that you can't find in in the British newspaper archive, um, and you get some uh, some really useful stuff um, on in the Internet Archive. I think particularly um, in terms of yeah, kind of historical books um, and sort of yeah, travel writing guides. So, yeah it's, it's worth kind of um exploring just to see what's out there so that was a bit of a gallop through um do you guys do you guys have any questions or any thoughts um was that useful <laughs> Yeah, that was very helpful. Thank you. Um, what what do you think you might be likely to use within that set? Uh, I guess de depending on what I'll be looking at, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what um, what do you what do you have to do? uh for your undergrad at the moment do you still have to do a, a kind of um like a desktop survey or desktop analysis yes. uh, as or oh, as of yet i haven't either sorry i've also had undergrad all right <laughs> i think that's in third year so i would have done that last year okay like do they give you a site and say um you know produce a report on this or they the way they did it at least when we were doing it they're like oh yeah this this is the area mm -hmm. where there's a proposed development or okay, yeah. something like that mm -hmm. and then it's it's your task to look up as much as you can and then sort of not just do a, a desk-based survey kind of thing but also propose mm -hmm a survey to just check out the area as well. Yeah. Yep, that's a desktop survey. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how what, how how did you research that? What sources did you look at? Um, I started off just going through past map and Canmore. Mm -hmm. I did look at the statistical accounts as well. Okay. Cool. And I was I was very happy that they have the function where it just can take the because it, it goes from either scan sheets of paper to just a transcription of the text. So that was very helpful to me to not have to read the the, the print. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um... And also did some stuff on Digimap to try to find if there was any LIDAR data available for that particular oh, yeah. area. Yep. Um, what, Charlotte, was it you that said you were in third year? Um, I've, I've been on a year abroad as um, part of a joint, as a joint thing. So um, it, I'm like in the gap between my second and third year. I'm in oh, like yeah. 2.5. <laughs> um, so I'll... Uh, I had that to look forward to next year, but thank you for the advice on that, actually, because <laughs> I would have no idea how to approach a desktop study. Well, yeah, start start with past map. That's a good shout. Um, so that will get you any kind of um, any red flags, really, any sites that are statutory protected. So um, listed buildings, scheduled monuments, that's the ones you are a world heritage site. <laughs> um, the rest are a little bit less. Um, what's the word? Uh, like they haven't, they would have an impact, but yeah, like it, it depends very much on the site. But those, those are the two that you want to look out for. And then, um, so you probably also want to do a historic map regression. 
Um, so go into the National Library of Scotland maps website and you just systematically go through uh, from earliest to latest, um, you know, looking at what's actually, you know, what's recorded on the ground. Um, as Tita said, yeah, the, um, oh God's sake. What was the other document you looked at? Was it, was it the place name, always place name book? Uh, I was going through the statistical accounts, oh, the, the old statistical, statistical account. account. That's right, yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, statistical account or yeah, the ordnance survey place name books is another key to get in there um, because it ties in with the ordnance survey, um, you know, the first edition map. Um, yeah, so if you, if you get those knocked off, then yeah, you'd, uh, you've got a solid foundation there. Um, I mean, yeah, archaeology does pop up in kind of unexpected places as well. It's not something that you necessarily need to worry too much about as a student, although uh, maybe when you get to kind of dissertation level, um, it's worth starting to dive into some of those archives. But um, say, for instance, um, so on the south side of Glasgow in Queen's Park, um, if you know it, there's a, there's a big circular earthwork right on the top uh, of the hill in the park um, and probably Iron Age. It's had a little bit of kind of excavation done. Um, so the, it's recorded on past map, it's in Canmore. Um, you would also find it uh, on the Ordnance Survey maps um, and um, what else? Um, God, I'm trying to think. <laughs> oh, you might look at the um, National Collection of Aerial Photographs as well. That might be a good one to look at. Um, but so you might, yeah, you'd go to your kind of usual sources. Um, but actually, there's a really amazing set of photographs in Glasgow School of Arts collection of that site because uh, their janitor was a, a really keen photographer and went kind of all around the south side taking photographs and was quite obsessed with the, the ring work and with Queen's Park. So, you know, it's a kind of sideways source that might get missed. I mean, obviously, that would be going into quite a bit of detail, but... Just because you're doing archaeology, like don't uh, don't forget about um, about archives because um, it will pop up in unexpected places, and sometimes it's not that hard to find either. Um, I think the other benefit of of looking a little bit beyond your kind of usual archaeology sources is um, some of those kind of traditional narratives in archaeology are very uh, male-centric um, and it's partly because they limit the sources that they look at um, and it's only relatively recently that say for instance we're finding out uh, you know there were a lot more early women archaeologists than we realized and a lot of them um, have just been kind of ignored or, or kind of written out and, uh, and they're turning up in in different sources, they're turning up in archival sources rather than kind of archaeological because their their contributions are not recognized are yeah are not recorded there. Um, so yeah, it's it's worth looking a little bit further afield. Um, so yeah, um, I'll... No, thank you very much for that uh, <laughs> advice. I've only ever really used a lot of these sites for um, kind of like. I forgot the genealogy, so like family tree stuff. So like, what was it? Scotland's people, horrible memories of having to use that website oh, to find documents. Um, yeah, yeah so a lot of this quite <laughs> yeah. not, a, not a fun time, not a fun no, time. No, no, not good. Um, okay, does anybody else have any other questions or thoughts or? Well, so I'll let you get your tea. <laughs> um, right, okay, well, I will 